Uh, because you mentioned that startup co-founders don't need uh, an MBA, uh, however, at the same time, you have five degrees apparently. So, so what's up with that? And uh, which, well, first of all, which degrees have you studied, and why did you go through education if you're a startup guy yourself? So, first of all, I need to mention that I think I'm in a rare example of the person who was initially trained as an IT guy because my first degree in my hometown in Samara, which I really love. Uh, was an information systems and technology. So like I get trained how to code even uh, even on assembler so that like I haven't code for ages but, but like I know how to like write code. My second degree was uh, actually being a translator in a professional sphere. Effectively, it's like me being able to speak proper English. I would question how proper it is, but this is another question. And like you should understand that I got really four degrees and like MB is my fifth education, but my first two degrees were, let's say, like in the same time. So like I did my information system technologies part in the mornings and my translator thing in the evenings. Then I have dual diploma in masters. Like my masters was, I spent one year in Moscow in a higher school of economics. And my degree was in e-business, like e-commerce business. And I spent another year in Vienna in a German word attention. Fachhochschule Technikum Wien, which is the University of Applied Sciences, Vienna, and my degree was Information Systems Management. So I think, as I told you in the beginning, I'm a rare example of a person who actually trained to be an IT guy, then trained to be a management in IT, and I'm still doing more or less the same. And like, and it took me literally the same amount of time that it took a per one person to do bachelor and masters on average. But like, I think I'm very good in studying so let's see i understand how to uh, invest the least possible time into studies but still pass so i got zero diplomas with distinction and as many of my group mates are aware i always ask the lecturers about how to get over 40 which is like pass in the exam but still like as i mentioned before to you my least mark is 48 by the way i have no idea why people shy about their, their marks because like i think that's okay because like i never judge people based on their uh school performance because i think it's very douchebag if you ask me because the people are people first and i try to uh evaluate others first of all based on their actions not what they say and definitely not based on their school performance which is useless and there's probably not so much of a correlation between the grades that people get and how they would actually perform in that setting from that it sounds like you've put a greater emphasis on learning uh, rather than you know degrees themselves uh, do you value the MBA now that you almost uh, are an alumni of this university? Um, is it, was it, by that question, what I mean is, do you value the education that you received uh, from your MBA or is it the learnings that you received? Oh, well, I think, first of all, I would like to congratulate all of us who are actually watching this episode. Guys, I love you. And actually, we are recording it literally the next day after our classes ended. So like, guys, we did it. Like we got the May ball like ahead. So like we're gonna party real hard. And answering your question, Rashid, what do I really think? If you ask me personally, all of my degrees, they, at least in my view, they did not give me a lot of knowledge. What I mean by that? I think in the current like time, in the current like century, whatever, when the information is like say moving and technology is moving so fast, it is almost impossible to keep the knowledge up to date because everything become obsolete so fast. So what my degrees, I'm not talking about the MBA right now, but in general, what my degrees taught me is how to find the new information that I need very fast, how to research it, how to consume it and how to make conclusions out of it. Because like, you know, I was a, I was even trained to code on Lisp language. Lisp language is very outdated language. And like it was outdated even in 2010, and, but like, and still it is. But I think this is absolutely normal. But I think it's not even most important finding for me. And we are coming to the MBA as well. Uh, when I was preparing to apply for the MBA programs, and I actually applied only to Cambridge for, for like for, for, for many reasons. Uh, I read that. What, what, what are the what, what are a couple of those reasons, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, 
I think there is like there is like a whole different story how was uh, how I was lucky to attend the last in person uh, open day in Cambridge back then in February 2020. So here is like I will tell you the story because I think this is hilarious and I think I told to many people but not all of them. So we've got an open lecture as a part of the open day on strategy with Lionel, and. There was a part of the lecture when he asked the group of people who were like very like, you know, like in the, in the suits because like we had we have like an opening for the MBA, like they're very serious. And he asked a question like, guys, what do you think needs to be done in order to win a NASCAR race? You know, like this race is like when you when you're like making rounds, I suppose literally making circles. And like it was complete silence, and I'm a huge fan of South Park. I have seen all of the episodes at least two or three times. And there is a separate episode in South Park which name is poor and stupid with the idea that in order to win a NASCAR race you have to be a poor b stupid and that's all <laughs> and so like it was complete the, silence this, this, <laughs> i think this video is not going to be so popular amongst the americans in class <laughs> but like you know like south park creators are american so just like face it guys uh so i raised a hand and i'm like I'm not sure about the strategy and the proper strategy, but like according to South Park, you have to be poor and stupid to win a NASCAR race. So the class was dead, like everyone like laughed. Then actually as the people start to come up with the proper ideas of like tactics, strategy, all of this boring stuff. And then Lionel rolled the video and I to and like, he remembers this, I asked him about it. And there was some sort of a NASCAR executive who literally proved me right. So like probably he he said like in order to win a NASCAR race I don't know how to uh, imitate American accent like I could only know how to do Russian accent but like <laughs> this is a deal like in order to win NASCAR you shouldn't be very smart you just need to turn right at the right time and that's all so like I was right and it feels like this video was an inspirational part for the for creators of South Park to make this episode <laughs> and like for me it was a natural click like honestly because like. I understand how like I think all of us are strange to some degree but like I like I understand that like I'm kind of unique in my approach to life and me being like open about myself and like since Lionel and in general education talks with me in the same language using the let's say actual cultural references I knew that this is my place and also probably because of the building to, to some degree because like I visited Oxford like no offense to Oxford I don't want to get this thing started but like their building is very boring it's like our extension to our main building it's very boring it's called I like my first degree was in architectural university I did IT but in, and I understand that this type of uh, architecture calls background architecture so you don't notice it but I have a main building I love it I, I really do and like this is also a part of what I what's sold and MBA to me in Cambridge specifically. And like, this is why I think I selected Cambridge because like, I want like, and me being a lecturer myself, I always try to entertain the audience. Like, because I think it is absolutely okay when education is fun, when you are able to make jokes about yourself, because like, you know, you shouldn't be like very serious all the time, like very like, like, I don't know, I even don't know how to say it, but like, you should be you. And this is what I saw in Lionel's lecture at that moment. And I never regret about my choice. I even become more happy about it than I was before after one thing. So first of all, and bringing and getting back to the point where we started before. So when I selected Cambridge in the MBA brochure, they said that you're gonna be an MBA, a part of the MBA family. And like for me, being a very cynical person, I'm like, this is yet another marketing fluff. I don't get it really. Like, what does it mean? But as I told you, yesterday we have our last class and I can't be more thankful for our cohort and for each of you who are now watching the video, guys, for being so great. And naturally, somehow, like day after day, I realize that I'm really part of the family. And this is such a unique feeling. I never felt myself a part of the family before in any other four of my degrees. And this is, I think, the main outcomes that I get from the MBA. Not the knowledge, but I get great like knowledge in some topics that I was interested to. But it is the people. And this is how I feel about it. If, for instance, Cambridge, but it did not, but like if, fail in all other parts of the MBA, like if our studies suck, but they did not, or like all other things, if the building wasn't like that fun or whatever, 
but it do it does the same job in admitting unique different people with unique life experiences for me i will think that cambridge still nails this job and our mba will be still worth it so let's see for me people are the main component and like the fact that we got not only people which is a crucial thing but let's say the great buildings the great professors that are open makes the i think experience very unique and also like i talked to many others like uh, students of in other schools i don't want to bring names and i was so shocked that in many other business schools within the uk and outside of the uk's students are so competitive to each other and we are like so relaxed and so friendly so like literally it feels like a family and like i can't like i already said that but like it makes me get up in the mornings because i know that i'm gonna meet my friends and this is like this is a lot for me i'm speaking deeply from my heart right now yeah um i i think all of us uh, would relate to what you just said and, and that's really good to hear from from you uh, and I completely agree with this competitive part. Uh, I am a very competitive person naturally. Uh, I actually would have even enjoyed uh, having some degree of competitiveness. Uh, but what I ended up enjoying more is, you know, going to classes because I'm going to meet friends, because I'm going to enjoy talking to these professors. And, uh, and uh, I think the most important is you can be yourself and discover that there is a strength in being yourself, not having to be molded as somebody else. Uh, I think part of that probably comes from the uh, point of uh, the class being so diverse. Uh, there are people from, you know, uh, each industry. Uh, there's no over-representation in one area, although a lot of people will end up in consulting. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different matter. Uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> mo moving on to another question, uh, Daniel, uh, you said you moved around quite a lot in Russia. For, for instance, you moved from your hometown Samara to uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow. Moscow, I don't know why I said that. Moscow in, is like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ma Moscow. <laughs> Moscow. Moscow. Yeah. Uh, so you, you moved it quite, you moved quite a bit in, in Russia. Uh, it must have come as a cultural shock to you when you had to move from Russia to the UK. Um, uh, how, how did you find that uh, cultural shock? That's a great question, by the way, honestly. And I think I'm a lucky exception in this case, because since I was responsible for launching Eastern European startups abroad, I was lucky, first of all, to live for half a year in Hong Kong and for half a year in the United States. I did my master's degree in Vienna. So I traveled a lot around the world, like Singapore, most of the European countries. So like I have to some degree an international exposure and I live to some degree in many different cultures. So like it wasn't that hard for me uh, because like I know some of our group mates, it is their first time, let's say, living abroad for a long time. So like I was absolutely okay. And also I think since I probably have the same values uh, as a Western culture, I was born and raised in 90s hip hop. I love tech. And I think probably if you ask me personally, the tech industry in Russia, the startups industry in Russia is the most Westernized, let's say, industry out of all of them. So for me, it wasn't that hard. And like, you know, I recently read a very interesting article literally about be let's say getting settled in uk as being russian and i love the quote that like guys just like face it we are aliens in uk as much as for instance british will be aliens in russia but the only one thing that really matters is that if we are curious aliens so like and i think this is what i'm trying to be i understand that my culture is different but i de like i deeply respect british culture or any other country well, culture because like the, the country welcomed me, it gave me the education. For instance, the school gave me scholarships that actually eases the burden of studying here. So, like, I can't complain, honestly. And, like, for me, really, it's very interesting. There are some things that I could not understand, but, like, for instance, like, Russians are very straightforward. And I think that many people think that Russians are rude, but we are definitely not rude, at least intentionally not rude. But we could be rude unintentionally, but this is a different thing. But we're definitely straightforward. And it's hard for me to get used to this culture of small talks. And also, like, I think many conversations uh, are very superficial. And they intentionally superficial because people are very, like, protective about their personal borders, which is not the case in Russia. Because, let's say, if we are friends, we are really friends. We are talking about, let's say, real shit. Like, you know, about the life. And But, by the way... Once you pass, let's say, this barrier of get to know the person, like, and meeting with him for, like, a couple coffees or something, 
you already get into this relationship that I really understand when you are able to take to, to talk about the things that really matters for you and for the person in life. But like in Russia, you simply skip the step. You know, let's say you're either in with the person or let's say without. And like, there are lots of many different things, but like I like them. As I told you, I understand that I'm alien, but I try to be a curious alien. And I'm not, let's say, I'm not protective about, let's say, being Russian. I'm okay with integrate with the culture because I feel the same about the culture because like it's helping me in, in, in many ways as well. But I think the most interesting theory that I came up with during my uh, MBA time is a, is a board games theory. I'm not sure whether I ever told you about it, but this is the theory that I came up with. So, if you will tell me being Russian, that my other Russian friends, back then in Russia, for instance, spend the whole night playing board games, I will most likely think that their party was shit. And I will explain you why. So, first of all, there is no, like, culture, like, playing board games in Russia. Like, we play Monopoly, like, there are some people who play board games, but in general, there's not a thing. When friends meet, they, like, drink, talk about the things that happen in their life, and, like, friends, like, being friends. And this also, like, exists in UK, but... I understood that, for instance, I'm okay with playing board games when you first time met with a person because you don't have any topics in common and like you have to have something. This is like creating the moment for you. Or to play board games when you are bored of each other. So like you are friends for ages and you have nothing to talk about. You're more or less aware about each other. And this is also okay. But I'm not okay with substituting the moment of when you get to know each other with playing board games because I feel like this is what happening a lot in the UK and I actually thought about it to, like for some time and I understood that since people are very protective about their personal borders it is safer even when you know the people already to pour, to play board games and to maintain the roles because no one will interfere your personal like because they're like you maintaining the character then actually try to open up to people and i think i couldn't say this is right or wrong but like i intention looking for non-superficial conversation with my classmates and i think that like, many people are shocked about it but like i really do like it this is why for instance i feel that i prefer more like 101 chats or like 102 chats but like then the big gatherings because like it this big gatherings not not allowing me like to really talk to people to really get to know people because like, it's all of the superficial talks like let's say what kind of interviews do you have like you know here is the deal the last thing about let's say being russian when you meet a person in western world in the states and uk what do you say you say hello how you doing and the person say obviously all right how are you doing and then you like done in Russia, you only ask how you do it when you really want to hear the an answer. When we meet the other people, we say just hello. And the piece person replied to us, hello, and we done. So, like, we could, like, walk away. And this is, I think, kind of also very funny, quirky cultural difference. But, like, I think, like, I, I'm not sure whether we're going to get our uh, graduate yearbooks. But I literally mentioned, I remember what you're going to get in advice to OEMB is that when we say something in Russia, we really mean it. And let's see, when I say... How are you doing? I really would like to know how are you doing. Now, let's say, when I say something, I really mean it, and I think this is some kind of interesting, but I, I'm adjusting to that. But I'm also trying to keep, let's say, a Russian side of myself, because, like, I think Russia as a culture has a lot of to offer, all of our literature, music, and so on, and so on. Even, like, entrepreneurs. Like, for instance, like, Revolut is founded by Russia. My robot is founded by Russia. Even Google founded by Russia because Sergey Brin left Soviet Union at the age of seven. So, like, obviously he's, like, more American than Russian, but there are so many entrepreneurs that are Russian, so, like... Yeah, also don't forget Ethereum and Revolut. Yeah, yeah, I, I mentioned Revolut, by the way. Oh, you did, okay, hashtag fintech. It's, it's often thought that our failures mold us, uh, you know, m as much as or even more than our successes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have mentioned in your blogs uh, that your experiences of co-founding and operating a big nightclub in Russia, uh, how that failed. Um, how, how did that failure mold you and uh, change you into the person you are now? Well, it's, uh, I'm very glad that you, that you bring it because like, I think I barely told anyone about my past. So everyone is aware that I'm a tech guy, but no one is, not like no one, but like only a few people are aware because like, you know, it's it's like... It was so long time ago, so it was literally more than 10 years ago, but like really, at the age of 19, I was a part of the founding team and we opened 
1,400 square meters nightclub in my hometown Samara, which is hilarious. And we even got a strip bar in it. Two floor strip bar, by the way. And this is like, I think, very funky. <clears throat> but like the real thing is that I think from the age of 17 to the age of 19, I was a club promoter. Uh, we even recorded some songs. So guys, if you're curious to hear the songs that we recorded, just like message me. They're actually not so bad, by the way. I'm not embarrassed listening to them right now. And I will play to you, Rashin, it after our, um, you yeah. will be curious to hear. Even if you're not curious, I will still play them. <laughs> so my point is, that the real deal is once we opened the club, uh, we had to close it due to the lack of demand in a half a year, which was, and I was like, I think 20 at that moment. And for me, honestly, it was some sort of an end of a life. Like, because like at that moment, when I was 20 and I was very young, uh, I actually connect all of my future with the success of that club and I was like some kind of a club mogul in my head that I'm going to be successful, we're going to have more and more clubs and all of that, we're going to open the branches in different Russian cities and like all of these things. And when we failed, I think it taught me a very hard lesson in a very hard way that failure is a part of the learning journey. And like, actually, you know, I, I'm smiling a bit right now, but it was very fierce back then because I thought that I'm done with the life. Like, you know, I'm 20 and like nothing gonna happen better than that in my life. Obviously I was wrong, but like, tell me then that, I won't believe it. So like, it actually, and also probably my skills that I'm good at learning helped me to actually had a good degrees in my summer university and it allowed me to get into the best, actually this is the best Russian university, in Moscow to the master's degree. And from that, I think my tech career started. So like, I don't know, I, I don't have any advices. I think you simply have to go through some shit in your life to really appreciate what you are given by the life and really be able to look back and to learn from your mistakes. Because unfortunately, I really think so. We are not always learn from mistakes from others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so from your story, it sounds like you uh, chose to not continue down that route of becoming a you know nightclub mogul, uh, and, and you actually chose to pivot and go into a completely different career. Um, based on my understanding of of your beliefs uh, so far, where you you know should accept failure and and learn from it, you actually chose to to pivot uh, away from that. Uh, w would you say that is generally a good strategy? And, and how, how do you decide as a co-founder that maybe this isn't the industry for you and there's something else out there? To be fair with you, it happens like naturally. You know, it's by, by the way, it's a very great question. So like, I think two years ago, it was my first time when I taught postgraduates. Before that, I taught on the executives or like as a startup founders. And I remember the guys in the master's degree, they were like in their 20s, like 20 or 21. And they asked me like, Daniel, how to be as much successful in life as you are? First of all, I don't think that I'm successful, but this is another <laughs> topic. But still like, you know, and I feel that people right now are so concerned about their future, whom they should be, how to make the right choices now, not to regret them in the future. And they ended up with making no choices at all because they're paralyzed by these thoughts. Like, really. Because people are really care about the future. And like, you know, some sort of a idea of postponing the life that something will happen in the future if I will sacrifice right now. And I think this is completely wrong. So answering your question uh, on the actually how I did that, this is how it was. I was tech geek from the beginning. I love tech since my childhood. I earned my first money from, I don't know, selling the games for PlayStation Portable. So like, and it was back then in my ninth grade or like eighth grade or something like that. So like tech was always in my life. And like, this is how, I, as, as I remember, this is how it was. I decided that probably I need to go to Moscow for a better education. And then actually how I get into the tech. So the higher school for economics has some sort of it called winter school. They invite the, pros uh, the prospective uh, admits to the one week outside of Moscow to tell them more about the school, about the program. And as a part of that, there was a startup competition, a pitch competition. And the judge was a graduate of that program. And I won this competition and he offered me a job. 
and this was fibro, the virtual reality headset. So this is how it, it happens naturally. If you ask me personally, did I think that if I will go to this winter school, I will find a job? No, of course. But like, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the most out of each opportunity that I was given in life. Not to regret when I was old that I didn't like pursue, like, pursue it. Yeah, but it also sounds like you have been signing up to quite a lot of things uh, and indirectly following your passion. So uh, although, you know, you were you were coming out of a nightclub industry, uh, but uh, you knew that you were you know in love with technology and that it was a booming uh, area. And that's probably sounds like what got you to sign up to this uh, competition in technology and ended up uh, you yeah. know, getting getting your job in. Probably. But like to be fair, even in the nightclub, I was responsible for developing mobile app for the nightclub, website for the nightclub. Let's say like even select all of the specification of the computers that our accountants has. So like I was, let's say, despite the fact that it was a nightclub business, I was responsible for much more than that. I will, I was always trying to, let's say, have a tech exist in my life to some degree. So like, and I couldn't say that I signing to a lot of things. I'm not actually, I'm trying to do very little. By this, I mean, let's say not, I'm not an overachiever in the sense that I'm trying to pursue everything. But if I, let's say, set a goal i will do my best to reach it but like and i when i start something i always try to finish it to get a concrete result that i will be able to relate to so like i'm okay with failing i'm okay with it if it if, if it won't work but like i would like let's say when i when i'm going to sleep every night i would like to say to myself that i did everything that i could i mean like not to regret about it because like you know this is for instance the mba thing because like i saved money and I was in the place either getting a real estate, like to buy a flat, or to go to the MBA because the price was more or less the same. And like simply, I told myself, probably I should give it a try in order not to forget that I did not. And like, it turned out that it was a brilliant idea. It's like, to be honest, this is how I feel about it. Uh, in the current, very unfortunate circumstances, getting an MBA, it's first of all, like an immigration on my own terms. Secondly, it feels like winning a lottery ticket without being aware that you bought a, t a ticket in the first place. And finally, Daniel, uh, a very short answer uh, to which city, if you could choose any city around the world, uh, would you choose to do a startup in? If you had the choice of starting fresh and going to any place on the, on the planet? <sighs> it's a tough question. And like, I, I know, <laughs> which, which one would it be? I never thought about it, really, Rashin. This is a very interesting question because, like, if you ask me, and I expect that you will ask me, Daniel, what is your favorite city? And I got answer for that. This is Hong Kong. I'm a huge fan of Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah, I'm not asking what's your favorite city. Yes, yes, that's, that's... I, I know you like uh, Hong Kong food. <laughs> this question is specifically related to where would you do a startup if you could choose anything, any place around the world? You know, probably since I don't have a ready answer in my head, most likely I don't care about the city. Because probably I care about the people. And in this case, what COVID taught us to many other lessons that we learned during the COVID, that remote teams are possible and they could be kind of effective. So like... Elon Musk doesn't believe that. I like, you know, like he's like, he's a marketing genius. No doubts about that. But like, that's like for me, for me, like that's all. Like I'm not a billionaire and so on and so on. But like, you know, people love to create a figure in their life. It was like Steve Jobs. And Elon Musk is also a badass entrepreneur. Yeah, but like I, well. I'm not always like buys what he says because it's as Elon Musk said it. I'm okay with that. So like because I naturally do not think that I'm worse than him. And like I'm not measuring the people by the net worth. For me, it is more or less the same. Like measuring the people by the I don't know. Let's say shoe size. Or like if you have a bigger one, probably let's say you are like more successful in life or whatever. And I'm like. I don't know, I'm happy with my life, but like, I know that you hate for me for answering short questions so long, so please forgive me for that, Rashin. But like, really, like, I love UK, to be honest, right now. Probably, let's say, it also depends on the size of the business. Probably, for instance, if you have a remote team, it is better to register it, I don't know, in Delaware and States or in Dubai, because you will pay less taxes. But like, you know, this is how I approach the problems. I try to solve the problems as they come, or as we see in Russia, I try to eat this elephant by the slices. So like, probably when I will get into the point when I will care about the taxes, then I will get an, <laughs> then I will have an answer for you. But like at present, I feel very blessed to be in Cambridge, and I think this is an upright place to start a startup because you are surrounded by the entrepreneurs, and like you are simply, let's see, 
in the right time and the right place because it feels like we are getting into the yet another economical crisis. And if you look in the past, best startups was born during the crises. Google was born at that time. Facebook was born at that time. So there are many other reasons why they were created at that time and so on and so on. But like partially, it is the time to found a startup and it is the time to found not just a startup, but a business because it feels like it was kind of disconnected for the last few years. But at present, you should be profitable. You should be able to sustain yourself and think of this from this perspective. All of these, let's say, big companies, they were profitable more or less from day one. And this is also very important because if you are profitable, you are able to survive in these fierce times and then to thrive. And I think this is also kind of things that you should think of when starting a company. That's good to hear. And I couldn't agree with you more with uh, almost everything that you've said here today, surprisingly. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you so much, Daniel, for coming on this uh, very final episode, very likely to be a final episode. I'm sure everyone else is also going to find this as joyful and stimulating as I did. Likewise, Russian, thank you so much for inviting me. And like, guys, if you have seen the full episode, message me, coffee on me. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Anil. <laughs>